truly nobody out there cares about your career the way that you do remembering that it's what you do and not who you are and you do still have an identity and a personality outside of what you spend eight hours a day doing i think that's an important thing to remember Welcome to Career Relaunch, the podcast focused on helping you overcome the challenges of making a major career change. My name is Joseph Liu, and I'm here to help you figure out the steps you can take to move on in your career and make your professional ambitions a reality. In each episode, we'll be speaking with people who have an inspiring career story to share, learning from the brave leaps they took to pursue something new and helping you find the clarity, confidence, and courage to make your own brave decisions that improve your career and life. You can subscribe to this podcast by going to careerrelaunch.net, where you can listen to all the latest episodes and get more useful resources to help you navigate your own career journey. Today, my guest is going to talk about relaunching her career from being a marketing assistant to becoming a freelance writer. We'll talk about defining yourself in ways that go beyond your job title and dealing with people who critique your career choices. Afterwards, I'll wrap up with a few thoughts on more meaningful ways to respond to the question, so what do you do? On today's show, I'm speaking with Kat Bogard. After working full-time as a marketing assistant for the Green Bay Convention and Visitors Bureau, Kat made the decision to leave her steady job behind and pursue a career as a freelance writer. Now she spends her days crafting content, mainly related to career and self-development. Her work and career advice has been featured in The Muse, Forbes, Inc., Mashable, and Lifehacker. She spoke with me from Appleton, Wisconsin. Okay, Kat, thanks so much for joining me today. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. So I'd love to start by, first of all, just understanding what you're focused on right now in your life and your career. Yeah, sure. Well, I own my own business as a freelance writer. So I do a lot of different content creation for different brands and online publications. And really, the majority of my focus lately has just been on both running and growing my business, which has kind of turned out to be a delicate balance between the two of the things. Mainly, my work is online rather than print these days. So I do a lot for the muse. I do actually a lot of career advice. And did you know that you wanted to be a freelance writer or did you think about working for a publication? How did you how did you wrestle with that decision? Yeah, that was an interesting thing for me because I live in an area where writing isn't really a big career field. You know, I live in Wisconsin, not New York City or Chicago or San Francisco. So I guess I didn't always know that I wanted to be a freelance writer. I always knew that I wanted writing to be a part of whatever career field I was in, but I didn't really explore the whole freelance side of things until a ways into my traditional career. Can you take us back to what you were doing before you were doing freelance writing? Yes, I worked in marketing. I was a marketing assistant for my local convention and visitors bureau. That's kind of just this mouthful to say we marketed travel to our local area in an effort to bring tourist dollars into the local economy. So I mean, marketing travel was a pretty fun gig, but I guess I never really felt that fulfilled or challenged by what I was doing. A lot of the work was administrative, which I don't want to say that I was above because I was still a young kind of entry-level employee, but it just wasn't really work that my heart was in. So that was kind of when I knew I needed to explore some different opportunities. How did you know that your heart wasn't in it? That's an interesting question. And that was something I wrestled with myself because I'm kind of a creature of habit. I'm somebody who likes stability and routine. So I probably could have dealt with that for years because it was predictable and it was safe. But after a while, I realized that I didn't really enjoy the work. I just felt comforted by the monotony of it all. So work is such a big part of my life. And I don't want to sound like a typical entitled millennial, but I feel like I deserve to enjoy at least the majority of that piece of my life. And so that was when I really knew that maybe I needed to try something different. Now, I found you by reading a fantastic article you wrote, Kat, for the Daily Muse called Four Lessons I Learned from Quitting My Job with No Backup Plan. Can you take us to the moment when you decided to leave that job to pursue freelance writing? How did you go about that process of of quitting? Yeah, it's funny to even hear it, a moment of quitting because for me, it was just like this months and months long process. It was something that I really kind of wrestled with for a long time because 
I went back and forth between thinking, you know, this is something that I really want to do. I have to do this. I have to quit in order to freelance to, are you crazy? Like what kind of person would do that? You have a stable full-time job with health benefits. Why would you ever leave? So I went through that kind of internal conflict for a few months and brought the conversation to my loved ones who were very encouraging. And eventually I reached the decision that this was something that I wanted to do. And now was the perfect time to try to do it. So I made the decision to put in my two weeks notice and say goodbye to my full-time job. And one of the things that you talked about in your article was that you don't need the approval of others. Can you describe what it was like to share your news with others? Honestly, I got a lot of, you're doing what? You have a full-time job. What are you thinking? And that was really hard for me because I'm somebody who has the tendency to really seek the approval of others. I like being told when I'm doing things right or when I'm doing things well. It's just very reassuring to me. Like anybody, that really plants a lot of self-doubt in your head. You know, if everybody else thinks it's crazy, is it really crazy? So that was really a tough thing for me. How did you manage those skeptics who were questioning your decision? That was a challenge because I didn't... Honestly, I didn't really want to get into a long dialogue with them about it because I kind of realized it wasn't necessary for me to change their mind. Why did that in the long run, why did that really matter what they thought about my career choice or, you know, the changes that I was making? So I really learned to take a lot of it with a grain of salt. So I tried to really consciously not let a lot of that get to me or tear me down. And I also recognized that these people were probably really coming from a well-meaning place. They were genuinely concerned or confused or just kind of intrigued by what I was doing, that they weren't trying to be malicious or condescending or to tear me down. If you can recognize pure intentions and always consciously remind yourself that these people are coming from a good place and then be, you know, take everything they say with a grain of salt, because in the end, it really has no impact on what you're doing. That makes hearing all of that over and over again a lot easier. Okay, so you've kind of dealt with the skeptics. You decide to launch off on your own. Can you take us through what it was like on those first few weeks when you've moved from working for a stable organization to being out completely on your own? Even though I know people who run small businesses and I had some great resources there, there really was no rule book or step-by-step process for how I could pull this whole thing off. So I kind of felt like I was standing at the bottom of this giant mountain looking up which was really kind of terrifying, but it was also really exciting because I finally was really enjoying what I was doing and I was excited about where I was heading and there's still just a lot of pride in what I do. You talked about that in your article that scary is exciting. What did you mean by that? I remember putting in the article even, you know, that there's good reason that people pay money to walk through a haunted house or to go see... Right, I remember that. Yeah, yeah, a horror film or something like that because scary is scary, but there's also a big thrill to it. It gets your adrenaline going. And I think one of the things that makes it so exciting is kind of, it's, you know, the thrill of the unknown. And I think knowing that I was really taking the reins and I was kind of being proactive and taking charge of my own career future, that was really exciting to me, even though I didn't have a crystal ball that could tell me what was going to happen. So scary was exciting. It was scary, but it was also exciting. So it was just this really weird roller coaster ride of emotions. So what was the hardest part about changing careers for you, Kat? The hardest piece of the puzzle for me was actually taking the leap. Leaving my full-time job was a decision that I wrestled with, honestly, for months. So finally making that clear-cut choice of, yes, I'm doing this, I'm out the door. Coming to that conclusion was definitely the most difficult piece for me because I think for a long time, I kept trying to find these loopholes where I could make both things work for me. And when I eventually realized that that was just never going to happen, making that final decision of what my next step was, was the biggest challenge. And what do you think has been the most surprising part of changing careers for you? How fulfilling it is. You know, you read all these articles and you hear all of this career advice about 
when you're doing something that you love and you're doing work that really fulfills you, it changes your whole life. And I was kind of one of those people, and I'm one of those people that writes that advice now for a living, but I was kind of one of those people that would roll my eyes at that and say, you know, a job's a job, work is work, but it really does. Your work doesn't define you and it's not your whole life, but it's such a big piece of the puzzle that when that's not really working for you, it has such a huge impact on all other areas of your life. So once I was in a career field and doing something that I really enjoyed and really made me excited to sit down at my computer every day, it kind of just felt like all these other pieces of my life fell into place. But I guess it surprised me how big of an impact it had on my life overall and not just on my career. Can you take us through what some of those changes were outside of your career that you were experiencing? You hear a lot about like, I think the Sunday scaries are a term now that's been really popular in social media. And like I said, it wasn't that I hated my job or my career. I didn't loathe it, but I didn't love it either. And so that had kind of a big impact on my energy level outside of the office. I'd come home from work and I just want to kind of sit on the couch and veg out for the rest of the day because I was just, I felt so blah from the how I spent my entire day. And that had a big impact on my relationships, my, you know, like I said, my energy. It just, I wasn't feeling like myself anymore. I didn't have the same energy or zest for life that I have when I feel really excited by what I'm doing every day. Do you feel like other people who maybe aren't pursuing their passions, do you feel like they understand what it's like to have these other things now going for you in your life? Or do you feel like you have to kind of experience it by going through it to understand how much of a positive impact it can have on the rest of your life? For me, it was definitely something that I needed to experience. Like I said, I had heard a lot about it. Going through it firsthand definitely illustrates how big of an impact your work has on your life. And what have you learned about yourself through this process? Probably that I'm a lot more, I guess, a lot stronger than I thought I was. I think when I came out of college and had a full-time job and stuff, rejection or even edits or criticism and stuff, that was everything that I focused on. It's kind of a normal thing to do. You can hear 10 great things about yourself and one small piece of constructive criticism, and you're going to obsess over that one thing. And now running my own business and writing for a living, that's pretty much my every day is getting rejection emails from people who don't want to work for me, revisions from editors, people telling me places I can improve. And even when I was trying to build my business, like I said, getting thanks but no thanks emails from all of these people that I wanted to work with but didn't want to work with me. And I think a few years ago, that really would have tore me down and put me in a pretty bad place. And now I've learned to really move on. So I think I have a lot more internal strength than I ever thought I did, which is a big thing I've learned about myself. Do you have any suggestions for people who are dealing with rejection? Because I'll tell you what, as a small business owner myself, I hear you completely that it's important to somehow remain a little bit detached from your outcomes because some things work out, some things don't work out. But over time, I don't know about you, but it it does get to you sometimes and Mm -hmm. it does wear you out. How do you manage that? How do you manage the rejection or how do you manage the people who say no? Yeah, that's still something that I struggle with because yeah, I don't want to sound by any means like if you get slapped in the face enough times, eventually it doesn't hurt because it always, it always stings a little bit, especially if it's something that you're really excited about and the other party is not as excited about it. Keeping your eye on the big picture and what you're really working toward. I know for me in the beginning, it was so easy to get so wrapped up in those little details and those constant no's that I kind of, forgot to keep my eye on the prize and wasn't celebrating my wins because I was so focused on my losses. Always kind of keeping your finger on the pulse of what you're working toward and what you're building. You'll see, you'll still see progress, even if there's a lot of no's along the way. And that in and of itself is encouraging. It gives you something to keep working toward. You know that you're taking steps in the right direction, even if there are a few steps back along your course. Now, another thing that you talked about in your article, which I'd love to spend a couple minutes on, is that your career really doesn't define you. 
And you mentioned that your job isn't who you are, it's what you do. How did making this move change how you defined yourself? For so many of us, our career really does define you. I mean, what's one of the first questions you get asked when you're anywhere making small talk? It's, oh, what do you do? What do you do? Yeah. So I think that that's a big part of everybody's, not only their professional identity, but their personal identity as well. Those two things, like I said in the article, really become intertwined. What you do really becomes who you are. And that was something that I struggled with when I decided to do my own thing, because I think there was a little bit of that imposter syndrome because Mm, I felt like I couldn't really call myself a writer and I couldn't really call myself a business owner because I felt like I really wasn't doing it yet. You know what I mean? I felt Mm. like, I don't know what I was waiting for. If it was some big accomplishment or some grand byline where I would finally feel like, okay, now I can tell people what my job title is or whatever. But that was something I struggled with because prior to starting my own business, I would always respond to people and say, you know, oh, I work in marketing or I'm Mm -hmm. employed here. And it was so easy to define myself. Yeah. And once I started doing my own thing, I felt like it needed so much justification behind it, if that makes sense, because I still get people today that will look at me like, like, oh, you know, sure you do. And I've even had people tell me like, oh, so your husband makes the money then. (laughs) (laughs) Which is always so funny to me. So I always feel like I need to explain my choices to people. I just kind of realized nobody really cares that much, which sounds brutal, but truly nobody out there cares about your career the way that you do. Remembering that it's what you do and not who you are, and you do still have an identity and a personality outside of what you spend eight hours a day doing. I think that's an important thing to remember. Yeah, that's such a great lesson, Kat. I can tell you that I definitely have experienced some of the similar things that you mentioned, especially when I went off on my own, is almost having to justify and over explain what I do, almost like I'm trying to convince myself. Right. Okay. And when you look back on your career change, what's something that you wish you had known that you now know? Just to have a little bit more faith in myself and faith in the process. I think if you want something bad enough, you'll definitely do everything that you can to make it work and make sure things take shape. Patience was a big thing for me too, that I wanted it and I wanted it now, but the world just doesn't really work that way. What's the best career advice you've ever received? Everybody really has their own path and their own experience. And so you really kind of need to rely on your own instincts and trust yourself with the decisions that you make because no two career paths are the same. So there's really nobody out there that can give you, you know, this perfect roadmap to navigate you to success. You really kind of got to lean on yourself and put a lot of faith in yourself in order to get the end result that you want. And just to kind of wrap up here, Kat, can you just tell us a little bit about your blog, first of all, which is Lemonade Linings, and a little bit about what you're focused on right now? Well, Lemonade Linings is actually my blog that I started a few years ago, I actually started it when I was still working full time is just this innocent creative outlet where I could just write about the things that I wanted and share my interests with people. And I started going through this huge career shift and this huge change in my own life. So I really changed my focus to career and self-development. And now I blog about people who want to kind of get out and do their own thing, particularly if they're in the editorial or writing fields. Well, so where can people go if they want to find out more about you, Kat? Yeah, well, they can definitely check out my blog. That's just LemonadeLinings.com. Or they can come find me on Twitter. I tweet a lot, especially about things that I've written. And I like to interact with people who ask me questions on there. So that's a great place to find me as well. Well, thank you so much, Kat, for talking with us today and sharing some thoughts on how to define yourself outside of traditional ways. And then also just to remind yourself to trust your instincts. So thanks so much for your time. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It was great to be here. So I hope you enjoyed hearing Kat's thoughts on defining your identity on your own terms, building resilience, and trusting yourself. Now it's time to wrap up with today's Mental Fuel, where I'll be sharing my own thoughts on handling the question, so what do you do?
This is the part of the show called Mental Fuel, where I finish the show with a brief personal story related to one of the topics we covered today and wrap up with a simple challenge that'll hopefully benefit you during your own career transitions. So for today's Mental Fuel, I'm going to leave you with a few closing thoughts on the question, what do you do? Something Kat and I touched on. Now, this is a question that comes up a lot. If you've ever been to a networking event or a conference or even a party, you probably either asked someone this question or you've been asked this question. And when people ask this question, they're generally asking you what you do for a living. So for most of my professional life, whenever someone asked me, what do you do? I would just respond with my job title, which was fine during those times in my life when I had what I would call a traditional job or a job where I was conveniently placed at a really well-known company. But I'll tell you what, I started to really dislike this question because I felt judged. I felt judged about how important I was or how successful I was or how much money I made or if I was someone they even wanted to keep talking to. It was especially bad during those times when I was between jobs or I was in some sort of a career transition. And I remember one time when I had just left my full-time job in 2013 to start my business, I was still working out what to call myself. And I was at this marketing conference. And instead of giving people my usual response, working for a big name brand, I said I was an independent career consultant. And I would love to say that the people there were as interested in talking to me, but the reality was they weren't. They just weren't. And what I realized later was that I was actually part of the problem because I would just respond with my job title and stop there. So then people would define me by my job title and that was it. It really wasn't until recently that I began to respond by including other things that mattered to me, like my mission. So for example, instead of just stopping with my job title, I'll go on to say things like, I'm focused on helping people make brave decisions to relaunch their careers. Or instead of just telling people about the parts of my job, I'll go on to tell people what I love doing, like public speaking or connecting with people when they're on the cusp of making a change or launching their own business. Now, to be honest, it felt a little weird to do this at first, but I've actually been pleasantly surprised at how much more of a connection I have with the right people when I do this. And there have even been some professional opportunities that have come up once people know what I really care about. Anyway, I'm sharing this story with you because the reality is people are going to ask you this question. What do you do? It's actually a reasonable, socially acceptable conversation starter. So I definitely get why people ask. But how you respond matters. Because if you respond by doing what I used to do and just tell people your job title and stop there, people are going to define you by your job title and stop there. More importantly, you're implicitly signaling to yourself and to others that you are in fact defined by your job title. Now, I'm not saying to go completely touchy-feely on people, but if you let your guard down just a little bit, and if you describe yourself in ways that go beyond your job title, it'll help reinforce the fact that your identity has more dimensions. It lets you share a more complete picture of who you are and what you stand for, and that can be really energizing and expansive, especially because it helps you more deeply connect with other people who believe in the same things. This makes me think of a quote that's been attributed to Dr. Seuss, amongst others. Be who you are and say what you feel, because those who mind don't matter, and those who matter don't mind. So my challenge to you is to share something else about who you are that goes beyond your job title the next time someone asks you the question, what do you do? I'm not asking you to do this just for the sake of doing it. I'm asking you to do this because I really believe that verbalizing a less obvious part of your identity helps amplify and broadcast who you really are to the rest of the world. And you just never know what opportunities can open up once people get a more complete picture of you. So what's one more detail you could share about yourself the next time you're asked the question, what do you do? If you want a few ideas of meaningful, additional details you could share about yourself that I've found can sometimes open up some interesting conversations and professional opportunities, you can download a free worksheet to get you started at careerrelaunch.net slash episode 10, where you can also find a summary of the key ideas and links mentioned today. While you're there, I'd love for you to subscribe to the show or leave me a comment letting me know how people react to your new response to the what do you do question. You'll find the links to do that right there at careerrelaunch.net slash episode 10. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Career Relaunch and a special thanks again to Kat Bogard for joining us today. This episode was mixed by Raid Sandtrack. Electrocardiogram wrote and performed our original theme song. I'm Joseph Liu and I'll see you next time. Music